The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. The next presentation is going to be on mechanical response and micro CD characterization of 3D printed cement based elements uh, to be presented by Mohamed Reza Moini from Purdue University. Thank you for being here. Um, I present to you today uh, my research on mechanical response and micro CT characterization of 3D printed uh, cement based elements uh, with control uh, architecture. Um, I am Reza Moini and I present this on behalf of our team, my advisors, Dr. Oleg, Dr. Zawatieri, um, Dr. Youngblood at um, Civil Engineering and Material Science at Purdue. Dr. Oleg is here. Um, and our collaborators on this project are Dr. Bernanke and Dr. Sanchez from uh, Tennessee Tech and Vanderbilt University. Uh, just before I start, I just wanted to quickly mention that uh, we started this in 2016 and uh, there has been great, great works, and including the talks today. Um, what I present today here is a little bit of our approach on um, 3D printing um, on one of the aspects we're focusing at Purdue um, we, that we believe could be uh, looking into new, leading into new ways of um, thinking, maybe, or perceiving uh, designing materials and structures in future. Um, so I'm going to get to the point now. Uh, what we call here today as direct ink writing um, is essentially a layer by layer uh, method of fabrication of patterning materials in three dimensions. And uh, it's an extrusion based uh, fabrication technique uh, via a controlled computer stage or so-called gantry as opposed to other types such as slip casting and so on. Um, it's the, re the reason I refer to it as direct ink writing is that it's a uh, essentially a printing platform, it's a printing technique as opposed to overall umbrella of IoT manufacturing and 3D printing. And it's good for uh, 3D, uh, free IoT manufacturing of colloidal gels, polymer melts, and for one cement paste is a colloidal gel, as we all know. And so this is a desktop printer and we use it as a prototyping skill. We've developed other printers, but that's beyond the scope of this work. Um, and so to do direct writing for cement paste, you need to reconfigure your printing platform and process. And so you also, um, need to do modifications uh, that I'm not going to get into detail, but you also can work with like materials such as silicon and chocolate to integrate and parameterize. Um, and I won't touch on ink development, flow processes, rheologies, and extrusion shape holding. Those are, like I said, other aspects of the work uh, that we won't be talking about today. Uh, so direct ink writing can do more than just fabrication for us. It allows us to actually look into uh, interrelationships between processing structure or so-called microstructure depending on your level and pro uh, properties and performance of your materials. And so by doing that, it enables you actually to control the geometry and pattern or architecture of the material. And so you can now create architecture material that I'll use across this presentation. Uh, and that's nothing new. It's been done for decades in other materials and ceramics, but I think this is the first time we're actually trying to do that with cement paste at a variety of scales. And to briefly mention what it is, it's a combination of materials and space in which uh, the elements eventually give you properties that are not offered by one material or the structure alone. Um, and so I'm going to add one more thing here. So I think we all from the 50, 60, and probably 70 papers that are out there on 3D printing right now, you can probably infer and agree that wiki interface is a challenge. Um, and we all know that that 3D printing in general comes at the cost of uh, weak interface. And so the question we all have to think about and answer moving forward is, is that something we want to embrace, we want to eliminate it, is that a challenge or that could that be an opportunity? Uh, we're creating internal, introducing internal flaws to the system. Now, if you could combine control of the architecture with this weak interfaces, now what could you do with it? And our hypothesis here is that we could have um, enhanced mechanical response. Potentially, you could control uh, mechanical response of this structure as well. If you could do 3D printing and control the geometry, what can you print with it? What, can, what kinds of architectures can you achieve? Well, for one, you can achieve a, a honeycomb architectures. 
you can have, this is not an architecture, it's a prism with solid, on top, uh, with solid bottom and top layers. You can have a grid architecture, you can have a compliant architecture. Uh, you can have what we call Boolean architectures, but essentially it's a helicoidal pattern in which at each layer, uh, you rotate the direction of the filaments and then you keep building up and that gives you um, a helicoidal pattern and we call that, we call every uh, rotation in the, in between the layers a pitch angle. And so you can also play with, uh, so if you print the, say, two degree pitch angle, if you rotate two degree as you build up, you get a structure like this. If you print 45 degree, you get a structure like this. Um, and you can also play with infill percentage and get a structure like this. So if you go from 60% infill to 100% infill, you get a solid element. Uh, so I want you to keep in mind that the one, the compliant architecture on the top right, uh, what happens if we actually go and test this? Um, the other thing I want you to keep in mind is that those three, the, these uh, bottom elements, we're going to present some mechanical response on them, so I want you to keep in mind how we have tested them in, bio, in uh, uh, flexural strength, uh, for flexural strength. Uh, and so if you take that compliant architecture and you actually test it, you might be seeing something a little different than what you're used to for brittle cement paste material. You actually can bend it. Uh, and you have done that just by controlling the design and the architecture of the material. And so uh, before the filaments make contact, you get a cyclic linear response right here. And then once they make contact, then you get a secondary response over there that essentially gives you a, this discrete, uh, two discrete uh, moduli or two discrete response in your load displacement. Uh, we are already starting to touch in, into areas that we haven't touched before. Uh, and so I'm going to add that interface characterization here again. So if we design a very simple test of three-point bending and we compare solid elements that are with elements that are 3D printed with different direction, for one, zero degree is, the, uh, is an element in which the filaments are printed along the length of the beam. And compared to 90 degree, which is perpendicular to that, and 45, what you're going to get is what we expect to be the strength. What you get for the, for the strength is the strength is actually not significantly different. Well, we all know processing depends on uh, these properties depend on processing parameters, environmental condition, and so on. But for this system we have used, you don't get any significant difference between printed and cast and between the printed elements compared to one another. Now, <clears throat> that's collectively on the sample. How about the way they fail? You get completely different response you get crack deflection at the interface and you get a secondary micro cracking <coughs> excuse me secondary micro cracking at the interface where that deflection occurs and that happens in the elevation view or the bottom view or and so <coughs> at the first two cases you get these damage mechanisms as opposed to the 90 degree you get a clear cleavage without any deflection in the, at the interface and without any micro cracking interface and so, so the takeaway from here is weak interface can be utilized to control the crack path and so you could potentially use it for fracture properties and to, to, to improve fracture properties of cement paste uh, or any brittle material for one that goes through solidification now um, those this that I was talking to you about so if you could design a test, and we don't have to talk about it now, but uh, if, you, if you could test them in, uh, for flexural strength, uh, what do we expect to get and compare them, compared, comparing these architecture elements uh, with, with CAS? Now, let's start with load displacement. You already start to seeing uh, additional inelastic deformation in which uh, you start with CAS and you change the pitch, you, you, you have the cast response, the, the gray one right there, and you see the pointer? You have the cast right here, and for Bulligan, uh, you have um, already an elastic deformation. You start to ask yourself quickly, why is that? Well, this is a very quick explanation on to why. Uh, some of these elements, some of, the, some of these Bulligan architectures, when you actually test them, you can, if you could detect the noise and the crack, you could actually hear the crack, and so you you already start to indicate that there is additional amount of energy that's being absorbed. And so that, that the linkage between these elements right here, for example, the linkage between these elements, they all break away without the whole structure failing. And so that postpones catastrophic failure so the material can deform more um, without sacrificing the strength. If you look at, if you quantify the amount of energy, uh, the work of fracture toughness, actually this is not fracture toughness, this is, this is the total amount of energy uh, absorbed. Um, 
uh, you would see that as you increase the pitch angle, the work of fracture increases. And if you have a solid element, that, that guy right here is that solid element over there. Uh, it's the same case if you have a small pitch angle and a solid element. Now, what about the strength? It's not sacrificed, except for one that has a different uh, characteristics. But the strength is not sacrificed. So we shouldn't worry about that here. here. What if we all put it together in a basic porosity um, uh, strength relationship? Well, theoretically, that's, that's, that's the theoretical relationship for porosity strength relationship. Now, all of these Boolean architectures with different pitch angles and, and solid and uh, input percentage, they all stand above. And some of them are actually significantly enhanced. It may not appear, but actually some of them are significantly enhanced compared to their Cal's counter counterparts that have the same porosity. Um, and so we even have some outperformance in strength. Um, well, that's, the question is, are we testing the same types of structure or not? And we can talk about that. But uh, for one, how can we explain these results? So let's take this structure, for, for instance, and let's see how does the microstructure looks like after it has broken away. So if you look at that, we're looking at, into the cross section of, of an eight millimeter specimen. And that's it. That's the, basically, these are two separate samples after they are fractured. Now you look at the uh, crack deflect, you, some of those mechanisms that we are seeing in the beams, you're seeing it here too. You see crack deflection at the interface, you see uh, associated, associated uh, micro cracking at the interface, and you also see a, a small crack twisting. Um, so, and that could be controlled by controlling the pitch angle based on the other studies. Um, now, what you are looking at is telling you that you have these damage mechanisms that allow toughening of the material, and that's why, for instance, for one, a solid, ele solid Boolean element with 80 kp angle and 100% infill has a higher work, of higher work of fracture compared to its cast counterpart. Um, and so therefore you could allow uh, controlled fracture and controlled crack growth or enhanced energy to occur, uh, and essentially in enhancing uh, the, the, the damage, uh, damage resistance and flaw tolerance of the element just by controlling. So that's kind of what you can infer by in incorporating some of the uh, themes or design motives as they refer to that in the terminology of architecture materials uh, could, and combining them with introducing actually internal flaws that as 3D printing has enabled us actually to do, uh, um, could allow uh, toughening mechanisms that could enhance your mechanical response. Now, one of the other findings is larger pitch angles allow you to uh, demonstrate a fracture through the material, whether that's a solid or that cellular doesn't matter. As opposed to smaller pitch angles, it allows you to, it, it allows for uh, interfacial damage to occur. And by that, you, what this is telling you is you could, you could control the design to control the response. Uh, however, one question is that needs to be further delved into is that uh, what is the role of interfacial strength? Because then that means that there is a uh, competing mechanisms between your interfacial strength and your design parameters. Um, now, um, I want to wrap this part of the work quickly here. So we have used uh, 13 minutes. Um, we have used uh, several architectures to explore um, the processing uh, structure performance relationship, and uh, that, for one, I really like to emphasize on. We all are going to go work on various aspects of uh, three, uh, of uh, this new fabrication method that we are enabled to do, uh, design with, but also we would require to know where do we stand with this material science tetrahedron in terms of these relationships uh, in any of the works that we do. But we have also combined architecture and interfacial porosity and weakness in order to improve the performance characteristics of our traditional cement-based materials. Um, and we've introduced unique damage mechanisms that uh, are promoted through design, um, and so it allows you to control the, the, it allows you, these toughening mechanisms allow you to control, um, to enhance fracture resistance and actually create flaw tolerant elements out of brittle material. So you're shifting a material that's actually brittle to a quasi brittle, and you're creating elements that are able to tolerate more damage without sacrificing the strength. And so this could be 
and approach in 3D printing and in design of materials and structures in general. Um, and from now, I want to spend like, a very short time on the interface itself. So um, we know interface is weak, but what if we could um, design a lambda architecture just layer by layer cube and look at micro CT at different scales of those being 32 micron and 4 micron. Now, if you look at these elements, that's, that was one inch by one inch by one inch cube. And if you look at these elements, what you see is quite, uh, what you commonly see is quite macro pores. They're actually visible pores between the filaments. You also see these little dots that appear to be micro channels later and appears that they're going to be interconnected to one another through, um, through interfacial regions. And so you also see a, a rearrangement of the filaments. They're supposed to go on a straight path, but they actually deviate from their straight, their straight path. You also see a white region right here, um, right where you see that those micropores are dark regions. And you start asking yourself, what are they? So what if you could look at them? Um, and so that introduces that when the core is homogeneous, the interface is not. Uh, and what if you, so you could look at them at a uh, higher resolution at 40? So if you take that little element and if you could look at it at a higher resolution, what are you going to find? Um, well, this is kind of what summarizes all those four features. You have that big macropore, and everywhere you have that, where you, you have an interface near it, of course, and right there you have a white region, which is essentially accumulation of unhydrated cement grains because you start with a low water cement ratio and the water is receding into the system. Um, and the lubricating layer that everyone was talking about today uh, allows uh, higher evaporation rates. And so you have that, you have the macropores, you have the micropores, and, and then these micropores are actually uh, appear to be connected to one another through micro. Uh, in form of microchannels. And so you go from um, diamond shape to a rectangular shape uh, pore that form the microchannels. And you actually, if you actually quantify those pores, what you see is um, if you compare these elements now with CAS, this is the CT of the CAS, this is the CT of the printed element. And if you quantify the amount of, if you do segmentation image analysis and so on, on the whole volume, what you find out is uh, this is 1% air, this is 3% air. And out of, out of the region, out of the, out of the four X resolution, what you find is those microchannels are showing 99% of, thank you, 99% of the porosity that you find at a higher magnification are actually one continuous pore, which means they're all interconnected, um, at least for this processing parameter. And so in summary of, of this aspect, I guess in addition to those four features, we know now that interface is porous and it's weak. And so it can be characterized with micro CT. The other finding is these pore network uh, that forms in the variety of scales actually align with the direction of the filament. And so now it also allows you to control the pore space, the pore network. You can now, not only you can design your solid network, you can now design your pore network and you can use that for a variety of applications. Um, and we can all agree that these are what I call processing induced heterogeneities. They depend on environmental processing conditions and they can, again, from all the literature that's out that has come out in the past two years, we can agree that it, it causes anisotropic properties compared to CAS and compared to the different directions. Um, and so lab-based CT is what we've used for this part of the study, and it's a great non-destructive uh, way to evaluate the microstructure of 3D printed elements in general because you're dealing with a 3D, 3D microstructure that you would require to characterize and understand for your design. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, NSF for this fund. Um, and Purdue College of Engineering, and uh, it's our team, Dr. Youngblood, uh, Material Science at Purdue, Dr. Bernacki, uh, Dr. Oleg, uh, myself, Dr. Sanchez, and Dr. Zolotieri. Um, and with that, I'll take questions. Those are my ACI elements I printed for ACI.